Hi, this is Chase Thompson, pastor of First Baptist Church of Central City, and we are so glad that you are streaming this sermon today. We provide these sermons online so that you can have the opportunity to hear and be reminded of God's Word at any time. We also hope these sermons will provide an opportunity for you to share the message of Jesus with others. Basically, we hope these sermons will build you up and lead others to know Jesus. That being the case, please know that our prayer for you is that you would be plugged in and involved in a local church. God calls us to be a part of a local body of believers under the care and leadership of local pastors. These sermons cannot replace that. So if you don't have a church home, we would invite you to come and be with us at any time. At First Baptist Church of Central City, we would love to have you. And thank you again for tuning in. May the Lord be with you. Good morning. So good to be with you all today, and we are so glad that you are here. If you're a guest with us today, we're especially thankful that you've joined us for worship. My name is Chase Thompson. I'm the pastor here at First Baptist Church, Central City, and again, welcome, welcome. If you have a copy of God's Word, open it to Psalm 119, verses 105 through 112. Psalm 119, verses 105 through 112. And as you flip there, I do want to say a word of thanks to you and to God as well for... uh, Celebrating a ninth anniversary here, they say, and I think I say this every year, but they say time flies when you're having fun. Uh, it feels like we just got here, uh, but your love for us and our love for this church, I'm so thankful for how it's grown over the years. My family unable to be here today, Owen's sick with a cough and fever, so Hannah's taking care of the boys. Of course, my dad, appreciate your continued prayers for him and mom, uh, but we are blessed, and you've blessed not only me, but our whole family, and we hope that uh, we have been able to serve you as well. Thank you so much for the privilege of being your pastor. Uh, If you know uh, it is Pastor Appreciation Month, and so if there's one way you can appreciate me, take notes, you can be here for care night today at four o'clock. From four to six, we will have care night. We'll conclude with a meal at six o'clock in our fellowship hall. We would ask that you would come and serve. Perhaps you're newer to our church. You've never been a part of a care night. You don't know what it is. You might be asked to do something you're not comfortable with, but you will not be forced to do anything you are not comfortable with. There is something for everyone of every comfort level to do at care night. So come be with us, 4 o'clock. We'll meet in the fellowship hall. We'll conclude at 6 o'clock for a fellowship meal in the fellowship hall. We need your help, and we want you to come and be with us. Also, Brother Kevin already mentioned, but next Sunday morning, 9.30 in the Fellowship Hall, we will have our fit ministry training. We are redoing the way that we do our first impressions team. So if you have been or if you have continued to sign up to be a greeter, usher, security monitor, or part of our welcome booth, we need you at this training because we're going to change the way we're doing things. We want to be firing on all cylinders. We want to make sure we are raising the bar for how we make first impressions. We need you to come be a part of this training. If you are not at this training and you've signed up or you've agreed to continue serving as one of our volunteers, let me tell you, if you're not at that training, it's going to be painful for me, but it's also going to be painful for you. And I'll tell you why. I am going to call every single volunteer and explain in detail over the phone, if you don't make that meeting, what exactly we're going to be doing from now on. I don't want to do that. I don't want to take the time to do that. And you don't want to answer that call, but I will keep calling until you do. So please come to this training. We will let out in time for Sunday school. It's going to be a brief meeting next Sunday morning, 930 in the fellowship hall. We ask that you would come. And then, of course, we'll have our trunks of treats uh, next Sunday as well. Again, we're in Psalm 119, verses 105 through 112. And today we are talking about the Christian's guiding light, the gift that God has given us to help us navigate through darkness and confusion in our world. The gift that God has given us that supplies us with wisdom and tells us how we are to live. And of course, we are talking about the very inerrant, infallible, authoritative, and eternal Word of God. We're talking about the Bible today. Uh, We recognize, of course, and Brother Kevin just mentioned, we have a goal this year that we collectively would read 50,000 chapters of God's Word this year. That's not just to achieve a number. Understand the real purpose behind that goal is that you and I would spend time giving careful and prayerful attention to the Word of God every single day. 
Brother Kevin already mentioned, we have a new tool for you to tally that up. I think a lot of you are reading, you're just not turning it in. You can tally that up now, and please make sure you put a grand total on there if you turn this sheet in. Uh, we weren't, we're not going to add it up. Brother Kevin said we don't want to, we're just not going to. So, so make sure you write your grand total of chapters each week, uh, but keep a tally of your scriptures. We want to make that goal, because that means that God's people are in God's word. Uh, Deuteronomy 29, verse 29 says this, it says, the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us and to our sons forever, that we may observe all the words of this law. And likewise, 2 Timothy 3, 16 says, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. Brothers and sisters, this, the Bible, is the only recorded and official words of God that we have. And when you read it, you receive wisdom for your life. You receive instruction for your life. You are given a guide in how you are to live and what your purpose is for living. We find all of these things in God's word. Everything you need to know is in here. Now, what Deuteronomy 29, 29 is saying is that there's a lot of things we will never know. The secret things belong to the Lord our God. But he has revealed truth to us in his word. And everything that is most important for your life is in this book. And so we ought to read God's word daily. You need to be in the word of God daily. And I'll put it one more way before we continue. How many of you, show of hands this morning, wish you could audibly hear God speaking to you? Raise your hand if you wish you could audibly hear God speaking to you. Well, wouldn't you know it? All you have to do is read your Bible out loud. And, and I'm serious here. This is God's Word. And if you want to hear God speaking to you in your ear, just read this book out loud because these are the very authoritative words of our God. With all that this morning, we're going to turn to the scriptures, and we're going to be asking the question, why should we take time to read the Bible in our modern world? And I'd like to invite you to stand with me now in honor of the reading of God's word from Psalm 119, verses 105 through 112. It says this, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. I have sworn and I will confirm it that I will keep your righteous ordinances. I am exceedingly afflicted. Revive me, O Lord, according to your word. O oh, accept the free will offerings of my mouth, O Lord, and teach me your ordinances. My life is continually in my hand, yet I do not forget your law. The wicked have laid a snare for me, yet I have not gone astray from your precepts. I have inherited your testimonies forever, for they are the joy of my heart. I have inclined my heart to perform your statutes forever, even to the end. Would you pray with me? Almighty God, we thank you for this, your word. And Lord, we know that your word is true and that it is holy. We know that it speaks to our very souls. And God, we pray now that you would open our hearts and our minds to receive the message you have from us this morning. Lord, I pray as the preacher that you would help me not to be a distraction to your word, to your people. But Lord, that you would speak to me as well. God, that you would move in our midst today, that you would use this time to give us more faith, to give us more strength and joy for following you, to give us more commitment to put our trust in your words and to live it out. God, I thank you for this church, and I pray that you would bless them, Lord. Each and every family, each and every person gathered here and those who are unable to be here today, Lord, I pray that you would guide them and bless them and give them your grace and your mercy. Lord, if there be anyone here today who's never received Christ as their Lord and Savior, I pray that you would draw them to yourself. Lord, if there be those who are hurting, those who need hope, who need faith, who need your joy, I pray, Lord, that you would speak to them this morning and heal the wounds of their souls. Be with us now, we pray. Pour out your grace to our specific needs that you know. And it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. You may be seated. I try to wake up early in the mornings. I try to get up around 4.30 or 5 every day because, uh, first of all, I like to exercise. I don't like exercising, but I try to exercise. 
Uh, and if I exercise, I have to do it first thing in the morning. I'm not going to do it when I get home. I'm too tired. I'm going to sit down. I'm going to be lazy. So I've got to do it in the mornings. But before I even do that, most importantly, I like to take time to read God's Word and give my attention, my prayerful attention to it, and to pray. And I use a prayer journal to keep me focused in prayer. But I like to do that first thing in the morning. Uh, I'll still do it later in the day. If I don't do it first thing in the morning, I just find that I'm more distracted. I have a harder time focusing, whether it's because I'm mentally tired or, or because I'm thinking about too many things that have happened that day. I like to do it first thing in the morning. And so in order to have time to do all those things, I have to get up very early. But when it comes to getting up very early in our home, you have to remember, we have a two and a half year old and a seven month old. And right now, God has given us a lot of grace. Usually, my dear wife is only up once, around 2.30 or 3 or so. But brothers and sisters, woe to me if I wake those kids up at 4.30 or 5. And so I wake up, and I'm creeping around the house. I have to get past their bedrooms to the dining room table if I'm going to sit down. That's where I'll read God's Word and do my prayer journal. And so I have to get up, and then I have to remember that our oldest son has set traps all around the house for me. He has set cars and balls and sharp toys so that I will step on them and slip and fall and wake up the whole house. And those boys will be so excited. And my wife will be so filled with fury. And so I wake up. And what I do, I don't turn on any of the lights at first. I pull out my phone. And what do I do with my phone? Oh, no, no, no. I don't use that flashlight. That's amateur stuff. I turn the brightness up just a little bit on the screen, and I use the light that comes from the screen, right, to show me the way so that I can get to the dining room, and I can sit down, and I can read God's Word. I use the light from the screen. Don't use the flashlight. It's too bright. The kids know. They sense the flashlight. Look again at verse 105. It says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. I have sworn and I will confirm it that I will keep your righteous ordinances. Verse 105, David tells us very simply that God's word, the Bible, lights the way for us. It lights the way for how we are to live. It lights the way for how we are to believe. It lights the way for us spiritually and morally. Therefore, verse 106, we diligently obey it. We promise that we will obey it. We recognize that God's word lights our lives so that we can see through the darkness and see through the confusion, and therefore we make an oath we will obey what God's word says. It's kind of like saying if the electricity lights my house at night, I promise I will keep paying the electric bill because I want to be able to see and if you want the benefit from God's Word in your life, if you want God's Word to light the way for you, you must read it. You have to make it your commitment to read it, your endeavor to read it every single day. Because here's the thing about the Bible. The Bible is the only source of absolute, God-given truth with no mixture of error that we have in the entire world. Through the Bible, God has told us who He is. Now, a lot of people like to try to guess who God is. Or they'll say, well, I don't think God thinks that way. Or I don't think God would do something like that. I don't feel like that's who God's character is. Brothers and sisters, we don't get to guess who God is. God is real. And we can't know who he is unless he has told us who he is. And through the scriptures, God has revealed to us who he is, what he is like, what he has done, what he is doing, and what he will do. Through the scriptures, God has also told us who we are. We are human beings made in God's image. We are made for eternity, eternal creatures, to live forever in God's presence. But the scripture also tells us that because of the sin of our first parents, Adam and Eve, all of mankind is now born into sin. All of mankind made to be with God has been separated from God. And all of us face God's wrath for our sins when we die, one day being cast into eternal hell. And finally, the Bible tells us what our purpose is and what the purpose of everything is in our lives. We are human beings made in God's image made to be with him, made to have relationship with him forever, and made forever to bring him glory. To bring him glory. And because of the fact that we have been separated from him, and because of the fact that we all fall short of the glory of God, God sent his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, into the world for the purpose of saving us. 
redeeming us, restoring us, and making us into new creation. His new creation. Jesus lived a perfect, sinless life in our place, but then he swapped places with us, and he suffered and died on the cross in our place for our sins. Jesus bore God's wrath for our sins in himself and died and was buried. But on the third day of his burial, the Father raised him up from the dead as king, as Lord, as the authority over all of creation. And now the scripture says anyone who will turn away from a life of sin and put their faith in Jesus for salvation will be saved. And church, a lot of people try to find a lot of different ways to get around in this world. A lot of people are looking for a lot of different ways that they might find fulfillment and eternal life and what they might think of as heaven. There is a stubbornness in the sinful soul of mankind to make something else work To do things, as Frank Sinatra sang, my way. But brothers and sisters, God's word guides our lives. It provides a light, a lamp for us in the middle of the darkness and the confusion so that we can see the way we ought to go. And therefore, as followers of Christ, we must diligently commit ourselves to obeying God's righteous words. And because the Bible is the word of God, We will obey it no matter what the consequences for obeying it may be. Look at verse 107. I am exceedingly afflicted. Revive me, O Lord, according to your word. O accept the free will offerings of my mouth, O Lord, and teach me your ordinances. My life is continually in my hand, yet I do not forget your law. The wicked have laid a snare for me, yet I have not gone astray from your law precepts when i was a freshman at wku i don't know if they still do this or not but we all had to take a university experience class it was just one course credit and they really put us i felt i was placed somewhere very randomly i think they just put you uh they're supposed to put you wherever you're supposed to go in terms of what you're majoring in i was an undeclared major so i was in the science department and i was with two professors who were evolutionary biologists uh, two extreme atheist professors And because I was so open with my faith, uh, they were open to antagonizing me about my faith. Uh, And some of it was done in jesting, but some of it was pretty serious. Uh, I remember one email I sent in for class, the professor wrote me back. And I signed my emails then the same way I do now, the same way I sign our church newsletter. I didn't sign it Pastor Chase back then. Uh, But in Christ, in Christ, I sent the email in Christ Chase Thompson. He wrote me back and he said, you know, you shouldn't sign your emails that way. He said, a lot of people aren't Christians, and I know you were raised up in the Bible Belt. He made a lot of assumptions about me. He said, you're raised up in the Bible Belt, and you think that's okay, but a lot of people are going to take offense Uh, when you sign an email that way. uh, It's a little bit offensive to me, he said. Uh, He said, you should really not limit your opportunities and the possibilities that doors can open for you just by offending others. And I wrote him back, and I graciously told him that I would not be here today if it were not for Christ, that he had saved me and redeemed me. I had given my life to him. And essentially, in a gracious, diplomatic way, I'm not sure how diplomatic I was at 18 years old, but, uh, but I told him that I love the Lord, I'm going to keep signing it that way, and if somebody gets offended by it, that's their problem, not mine. I was going to follow Christ. Brothers and sisters, you will face opposition for obeying God's word and for trying to glorify God with your life. Here in verses 107 through 110, David writes of the affliction and the hatred that comes from obeying God's word. And by obeying God, David had constantly put his own life in jeopardy. That's what he means in verse 109. He says, my life is continually in my hand. Nevertheless, he refuses, verse 109, to forget God's law. Meaning, he refuses to intentionally put God's law aside and take the easy route. David would have had an easier life. If he hadn't followed God, Uh, David would have had a much better life, perhaps, as far as riches and things that he could have achieved if he hadn't followed the Lord. Moses would have had an easier life if he hadn't followed the Lord. Paul, the Apostle Paul, would have had an easier life if he hadn't obeyed God. Jesus, our Savior, would not have been crucified if he had disobeyed God. And brothers and sisters, you and I could potentially have much easier lives if we choose not to obey God's word. Obeying the word of God can lead to negative consequences in your life and you have to understand that's not because God is punishing you 
or that God is not in control. But it's because the scripture says that the wicked world we live in hates God. Those who are lost in their sins are enemies of God and they hate his word. And so obeying the word of God can bring persecution in your life. Now, when I shared about that email and that class I had, that wasn't persecution. Okay, we think of that sometimes. That's a minor annoyance, if anything else. But brothers and sisters, we have fellow believers in Christ today in places like India, China, Muslim-dominated countries where they are beaten and coerced and sued and jailed and tortured and killed because they follow Jesus. Persecution you and I have never known, and hopefully we never will. But we ought to follow their example in being obedient to Christ no matter what, and we ought to remember them and pray for them. Obeying the Word of God can also seem like the least pragmatic thing you could possibly do, the least practical thing you could possibly do in your life, and you will be tempted to disobey. I'll give you a very real-world example of this. We are called as Christians to practice tithing, right? We give 10% of what the Lord has allowed us to make back to God through the local church. And so if you make $30,000 in a year, you're called to give $3,000 of that back to the Lord, recognizing you have it all because of Him. But when the economy is difficult and groceries are high and materials are high and labor is high, you might look at that $30,000 and say, you know, it's a lot easier for me to keep all of it. We're tempted not to trust God. We trust Him with our eternal soul, but tempted not to trust Him with our finances. Brothers and sisters, you will be tempted to disobey God in all kinds of areas in your life. Don't fall for the temptation. Romans 8.31 says, if God be for us, who can be against us? And so if you are antagonized for your Christian faith, stand firm in your faith. If you are tempted to disobey God, and if sin begins to look appealing to you, stand firm in what God has called you to do. If you're tempted not to tithe, trust God with your finances. If you're tempted to give in to sin, trust God that he has something better for you. And churches have to remember this in our day and age as well. Churches have to preach and teach the truth of God's word, even when it's unpopular, even when people don't like it, and we must not back down. You all remember I preached a sermon series in July, Juicy July, Hot Topics. The last sermon was the one I was the least worried about. I thought, well, nobody's going to have an issue with this. It was on transgenderism. That's what it was on. And so I preached that sermon, preached the truth of God's word, One of our church members graciously thought that it was a good uh, portrayal of the truth of God's word and posted it online. And we received some of the most foul, vicious hatred for our church. God bless that member for that member and for me and for the scripture. Understand, we have to stand for what is right even when it is hard to do. When we think about how we're going to operate our church and run our church, we think about how we do evangelism and ministry and baptism and discipleship, the Lord's Supper, church discipline. We must do what God has told us to do. It's that simple. God has made it plain for us in his word, and we follow what he says in his word. And church, when God's word is hard for you to obey, when it brings stress in your life to obey it, when you don't want to obey it, you will be tempted to come up with a better plan, a better procedure, a better method than the Lord has given you. Don't be a fool. There is no better plan than God's revealed word. And God's laws are a joy to all who would follow what Christ has told us. And thus we ought to obey his word. How long? To the very end of our lives. Look again at verse 111. I have inherited your testimonies forever, for they are the joy of my heart. I have inclined my heart to perform your statutes forever, even to the end. When Hannah and I got married, We made marriage vows. For better or for worse, for richer or poorer, in sickness and in health, until death do you part. 
Can't get out of this thing unless one of us dies. Hannah wants to get rid of me. She's going to have to kill me. That's basically what that means. We're in this thing to the very end. And you know, marriage for many people can be extremely difficult at times. Marriage is not an easy thing to do. It's not an easy endeavor to get into. And you will be tempted to quit. To go back on those vows. To get out of that marriage to say, I'm going to start over. For brothers and sisters, there is joy that is found in sticking it out. In the last two verses of this passage, David proclaims that God's laws are a joy to all God's people. He's talking here, of course, about Christians we know. And therefore, we are called upon to obey God's laws to the end of our lives. Obedience and trusting God is where joy can be found. And here's the thing. His decrees, His laws, His ordinances make our lives simple and easy. Because when we face hard decisions, we don't have to try to wrestle with what am I going to do. When we face something stressful and we have to ask the question, is it worth dying on this hill? Is it worth standing for this issue? All we have to do is know what God's Word says and do what God has told us. We simply have to trust God and obey God's word, and we will find joy in doing so. Jeremiah said of the scriptures, Your words were found, and I ate them, and your words became for me a joy and the delight of my heart. Job, in the middle of his suffering, said this, I have treasured the words of his mouth, God's mouth, more than my necessary food. There came a time for the 12 disciples when many disciples were turning away from Jesus. And Jesus turned to the 12 and he said, Do you want to go away also? And Peter said to the Lord, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have words of eternal life. And the scripture here in Psalm 119 says that God's words are the joy of our hearts. Brothers and sisters, we must study and know the scriptures. We need to digest and take the scriptures in every single day. And we will find that it causes joy in our lives. Some of you may be wondering, well, I do this every day. What do I do when I don't feel like it? What do I do when it doesn't feel joyful? What do I do if I don't feel motivated to get into the Bible? Well, first, I'll tell you what you need to do. You need to resolve in your heart that God's word is is vital, vital, more necessary to you than food, water, and air. It's vital. Moses in Deuteronomy 32 told the people the word of God was not an idle word for you. Indeed, it is your life. And in 1 Peter 2, verse 2, it tells us, like newborn babies long for the pure milk of the word so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation. Brothers and sisters, you have to make a choice a choice daily to read and to long for the Word of God. Our Baptist campus missionary at WKU, Brother Tommy Johnson, he's preached here before. He shares in a book that he wrote on discipleship about a grad student that he had a few years ago. And she had come to a point in her life, she always loved reading Scripture, but she was very busy. She was very burdened by her work. And she found the Scripture to be another thing that she had to do every single day. And it became stressful for her. It was a burden to her. But she made a commitment right then and there that she was going to keep reading it daily anyway. Persist in reading the scriptures. She shared her struggle uh, with some of the girls she was discipling, these college girls, and she told them what was going on. They would send her text messages daily. They would write a card for her, a note card for her, encouraging her to stay in the scriptures. And eventually she found that as she stuck with it, that joy that she received returned. Church, you and I need to stay in the Word of God because we need to know what it says so that we can trust what it says and obey what it says. And when we obey His Word, we find joy in our lives. And you need to do this to the very end of your life because you're going to have lots of temptations not to. Lots of temptations not to believe anymore, not to trust anymore, not to have faith anymore. You're going to have lots of temptations to try to find a better way in your life. And listen, many have tried, 
And all they have found is foolish vanity. You and I need to know and understand and trust and obey God's word. We need to live according to what it says. We need to organize our church around what it says. And we will find life and joy indeed when we trust and obey what he's told us. When we let God lead our lives. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, once again for your grace. And God, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that though we had intimate fellowship with you in the beginning, though we separated ourselves from you, condemned to our sin, Lord, you have graciously revealed yourself to us through your Son and through the revealed word you have given us, which tells us of our Savior which tells us of our hope, which tells us of the faith that we have, which tells us of the love that will fill our hearts when we receive Christ and his Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray that you would help us this morning to know and to trust and to live by this revealed word you've given us. God, I pray this morning if there be someone here today who has never received Christ as their Savior, Lord, that you would save them. Show them their need of cleansing, their need of salvation from their sins and draw them to the Savior. There's only one name under heaven by which men might be saved and it is the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. And God, for those of us who have professed faith in Christ, but Lord, we feel that we have become very pragmatic in our thinking, very practical in the things that we try to do, very practical in what we think will work and what will please those around us. God, I pray that you would break that mindset in us and help us Lord to live simply and joyfully trusting you trusting your leadership in our lives God I pray that you would move in our midst this morning that you would help us to draw near to you in faith believing and use this time for your glory and it's in Christ's name that we pray Amen